People of the past, the present, the far future, and the far, far future, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, circa 2023. My name is Jason Freeman, and it is my great honor to be here tonight to introduce Emily St. John Mandel. This is also great fun for me in a whole meta sense because tonight's author's book deals in part with the ins and outs, the good parts, the bad parts, and the weirdness uh, of the book tour. And if I can contribute to that weirdness in any way, <laughs> I'm all about it. Uh, she is the author of the international bestseller, National Book Award, and Penn Faulkner Book Award finalist, Station Eleven, an acclaimed meditation on the everyday miracles we take for granted, set amongst the travels and travails of a Shakespearean acting troupe in the years following a global plague. Uh, or, put more succinctly in a post that Emily today on Twitter said she loved, it's a book that asks readers, can we move out of the echoes of a life and really live? Uh, I, I liked that too, and that, for attribution's sake, was written by Michael Gray Eyes. Uh, Emily's other novels include Last Night in Montreal, The Singer's Gun, uh, and The Glass Hotel, included by Barack Obama and me uh, on his 2022 <laughs> summer reading list. <laughs> Emily is also a staff writer uh, for art and culture magazine, The Millions. She joins us tonight with her latest novel, Sea of Tranquility. Show of hands, who's read it already? Okay, that's not everybody, so no spoilers, people. Um, so I will just vaguely say that peripherally, sometimes directly, and sometimes not at all, it's set in the same universe as Station Eleven and The Glass Hotel, but sort of, kind of, not really. Uh, this novel follows the inter... Okay, and we're all getting these water alerts. Okay. Silence your phone for Watergate. Okay. Okay. This is all hitting... A this is really meta now that we're getting water alerts. Okay, let's get, let's get through it. Okay, so anyway, uh, time-hopping characters seeking love and metaphysical truth in such far-flung locales as the cities of the 21st century lunar service. Here's hoping one day we all experience the pleasures of living in a domed city on the moon's surface. But the good dome, not the other one. <laughs> Tonight, Emily will be joined in conversation by Phillies Laura McGrath, an assistant professor of English at Temple University. She is at work on a book called Middlemen, Literary Agents and American Literature, which I'm personally very excited to read. Uh, her writing has also appeared in The Atlantic, the Los Angeles Review of Books, public books, and in a slew of academic journals. She is also one of the founding co-editors of the Post 45 Data Collective. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Emily. And thank you to all of you. This is such a wonderful, exciting crowd. Um, this is such a strange experience to be talking to you about this novel. I know many of you in the audience have been privileged enough to read it, and you will know um, that this is one of the few novels that I have read, and, and probably you too, that features a book tour as one of the central plot points. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a whole thing. Yeah. I'm, something I did not anticipate, by the way, when I wrote this book, is that all the interviewers would be scared. Um, I'm so sorry, yeah. I, yeah, that, that was unintentional. Um, and like the, my stock line in every, uh, every event I've done is, you know, as long as the questions are not crazy, then, then like I, you have nothing to fear. Like there's no reason why you'd appear in the next book. So I'm just, I'm just gonna put that up there. The assurance is, is much appreciated. I did make a list okay, as okay. I was reading of what, what not to ask you. Um, <laughs> Because it's it's unnerving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have that effect on people. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I I loved I loved this novel. I am certain I am not alone in this this room full of wonderful people. Um, and in many ways, Sea of Tranquility feels like what I've come to expect from your novels. In that um, it's it's intricately plotted. We've got multiple wonderfully realized protagonists. We've got these beautiful descriptions that are at once. Um, otherworldly and then also totally familiar. Um, and, and there's pandemics. Um, and, and yet in many ways, this also feels like such a departure from, from your other novels. Um, so I, I kind of want to start with, with genre and with time travel. Did you set out to write a time travel novel? Um, I did. And I think the context for this book is really important, which is that 
I started writing it in March 2020 in New York City. <laughs> and you know, like, so if, it's a very strange book because that was a very strange year. Um, I, I feel like we were all a little bit crazy. We all have some level or another of PTSD. Um, there was this feeling I remember from when I started the project, which was, you know, in this fairly horrific atmosphere, um, just the constant ambulance sirens and the rest of it. I felt like for my own sanity, it would be nice to write a new novel, you know, just because in the early stages of writing a book, it's kind of a private world in which you have absolute control, which is to say it's the opposite of living in a pandemic <laughs> where, you know, you feel absolutely at the mercy of prevailing forces. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start a new book. And something about that time gave me a feeling of, it was like a kind of creative recklessness, where it was like, I don't care if I'm not taken seriously as a literary novelist. Everything's terrible. I'm going to write about a time-traveling detective um, <laughs> and set it on a moon colony because that was as far away from my apartment in lockdown as I could possibly get. Like, anywhere on Earth was too close was kind of my feeling. And then I explained that to a friend, and she was like, oh, so a moon colony, like a very constrained area which you can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, but that was the project. I wanted to write a time travel novel. Hmm. You know, it's interesting to hear you say to be taken seriously as a literary novelist because so much of what I've, I've loved about your novels is the way that you play with genre, the way that you've blended sort of a high literary realism. Um, you know, the, most, the, the, the closest character to me in this novel is Olive Llewellyn, who lives in uh, 2203. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's obviously a great distance between us. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how you think about genre in your writing um, and, and how you think about kind of the, the play with form, the play with generic form? Um, it's just a really fun thing to do. You know, I, I think that actually we're living in a really interesting time, not just to be a writer, but to be a reader, which is that it really feels to me like the walls between genres have crumbled in a really interesting way. Where when I first started out as a writer, I first started trying to get my first novel published in 2006, I think, 2007, somewhere in there. And you know, the book was rejected by 35 publishers. Um, a lot of the, you know, some of the publishers just didn't like it, which, you know, it's personal taste. But a lot of those rejection letters were something along the lines of, we just don't know how we would market a book that's more than one genre. Because last night in Montreal, it was literary fiction in the sense of being, um, of there being a strong focus on both prose style and character development. But it was also genre in the sense that there was a detective and a car chase and like, you know, the trappings of genre, mm -hmm. like that. Um, I feel like at this point, it's just really not a problem to write a novel that's more than one genre. There's, um, it seems to me there's a tremendous appetite for it. Um, you, I do still encounter people who take a somewhat rigid approach to genre. You know, with, with Station Eleven, there have been people come up, come up to me and say, you know, I heard the book is good, but I, you know, no offense, I only read literary fiction, I don't read sci-fi, so not for me. <laughs> and then people will come up to me and say about the same book, um, you know, no offense, I really only read sci-fi, and uh, my understanding is this is literary fiction, so uh, yeah, you know, same novel. <laughs> the, uh, an idea I love about genre was something that I think should be obvious, but sometimes isn't, which is that a book can be more than one. And I find that to be the most expansive and generous way of looking at the question. So yeah, I like the idea of a book that's literary fiction and also sci-fi and also a detective story and also a mystery. And those books are fun to write. Mm -hmm. And this novel is not just, you know, sci-fi, just, it's not just sci-fi mixed with literary fiction, right? You've also got the detective story. You've yeah. got the time travel novel. You've got what reads in many ways as straight historical fiction yeah, in, in the Edwin chapters. Um, and then you've got the, the last book tour on Earth, right, which feels right. very, very close to um, the last few years on Earth. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I'm wondering about what, um, what it is that sci-fi enabled you to do as a storyteller, or what it is that time travel enabled you to do as a storyteller uh, that perhaps kind of your, your standard realist novel might not? Um, it was partly the genre thing that, you know, with a t if you have a time traveler, you can visit everywhere. 
So you can dabble in historical fiction, as I do with those Edwin sections in 1912. Um, you can write contemporary fiction, which is where we have the February 2020 segments, where COVID is just about to arrive. Uh, and then you can move into the future with that last book tour on Earth section in 2203, and then the far future in the moon colonies. And you can have one character occupy all of those timelines. So it was kind of fun for character development, you know, to be able to send the same person to all of these different genres and time periods. And just kind of an interesting formal experiment to blend all these genres together in the same book. Mm. Uh, Emily and I were joking backstage, I think one of the bleakest things in this novel was the idea that in 2203, a mob might still be asked, where are your kids? <laughs> Who's yeah. taking care of your kids okay. while you're working? Yeah, on a business <laughs> trip, just for context there. Yeah, Obviously, nothing that I've ever experienced. And, uh, of course not. No. <laughs> Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in this time travel question in, in the figure of Gaspari. This novel has so many, as do all of your novels, has so many artist figures, so many writer figures. And we've got Olive, who is a um, fairly obvious stand-in mm -hmm. in many ways. We can talk about that in a little bit. But then we've got Gaspari, who is also, I think, um, working in a very writerly sort of way, uh, who's able to move through times, who's able to intervene in, in particular ways, but also, and, and I think uh, something that's really unique and, and wonderful about your work, he's also able to visit the world of Station Eleven, and he visits <laughs> right. the world of the Glass Hotel, as we see so many of these figures recur. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your process as a writer, your return to some of these books that you'd written before, whether that's via Morella and Vincent, mm -hmm. or I guess via Morella and Vincent, also Miranda and Leon. Um, are, you, are you a time traveler? Is this the <laughs> Emily St. John Mandel project? <laughs> um, I'm building a multiverse. Oh, yes. It's really fun. <laughs> I recommend it if you're a writer. Um, no, in all seriousness, I sometimes just become attached to particular characters. So all of my books stand completely alone, and you really don't need to read them in any specific order. But sometimes I'll just want to bring a character back and spend more time with them and maybe consider a different aspect of their lives. So in Station Eleven, you meet Miranda as a graphic artist and writer. You know, she has this, the Dr. Eleven comic book series. Um, she's a shipping executive in Station Eleven, but in a very peripheral way that you barely see. And I kind of liked the idea of flipping that around. So in The Glass Hotel, she has a very small role, but she's just a shipping executive. You know, there are intimations that she's working on something, where there's a moment when a colleague sees her sketching something that, that we know is the graphic novel, but he doesn't know that. So, you know, it was interesting to see a different aspect of her life. But then, with Sea of Tranquility, it was a little bit different, because so, you know, we're in March 2020. I just published The Glass Hotel, which we were talking about backstage. Uh, the publication date on that book was March 24th, 2020, so there wasn't a tour. Um, <laughs> there, was a, there was a lot of time on Zoom, which was great and then not. Um, and, yeah, so then, you know, everything's terrible. I start writing this weird time travel novel, and I realized I had to pick the timelines. So I did want to try writing historical fiction, and I was interested in the phenomenon of remittance men, um, which we can get into or not, but yeah, so that gave me the 1912 sections. And then a period that I find really fascinating is the month of February 2020 in New York, and I assume it was a very similar thing here, where it's not like we didn't know what was coming. You know, like, obviously, the pandemic was pouring into our cities by the hour. We all have international airports. We knew what was going to happen, but we didn't believe it. It seemed to me at the time, and it still does, to be almost a mass failure of imagination, where we were blasé about it in that big city way. Like, oh, you know, obviously, it's already here, and it's going to be bad. Um, but then we would shake hands with strangers and drop off our kids at school and get into the metro and, you know, go to choir practice and unventilated basements and like all the things that make absolutely no sense when you know it's coming. So I, I'm kind of fascinated by that and I knew I wanted to, wanted that to be one of the time periods. And then I realized I had this cast of characters right there from this book I'd just published who were very plausibly in New York City that month. And it was just kind of interesting to bring them back. 
you know, so that's why Paul, Morella, and Vincent, you know, all reoccur in, um, in that February 2020 section in this book. Hmm. It must have been interesting, too, to have written uh, an artist at the end of the world, a post-apocalyptic artist in the figure of Kirsten and the Traveling Symphony, and then uh, an artist at the end of the world in, in terms of Vincent kind of literally on, on a ship but past, past land. Um, uh, and, and then to kind of find yourself in that situation, too. I, I'm curious to know, um, to know what it was like to kind of live your own creation in some ways. Um, you know, like my stock answer is it was surreal. But on the other hand, whose life wasn't surreal you know, in March 2020? <laughs> it's like nobody was having a good time. Um, yeah, it was very strange. It was... It was a really weird experience to sort of be, um, to have my work talked about in almost prophetic terms because Station Eleven had come out in 2014, like years and years ago. What was clear to me in my research for Station Eleven is that there was always gonna be another pandemic. Knowing that intellectually is not the same thing as expecting it to roll in like six or seven years later. Mm -hmm. um, I was as surprised as anybody, which is kind of embarrassing. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, it, it was a strange experience to, uh, to be the author of Station Eleven in the early days of COVID-19. There were a lot of invitations for op-eds and essays about that experience, which I turned down. But it was kind of weird and interesting, and I did want to write about it. So I had been working on these fragments of autofiction, which, um, for anybody unfamiliar, that's autobiographical fiction which I think of as fiction that's just slightly more obviously based on a writer's life. Like, you know, we always pull our own stuff into our, into our fiction. So I'd started writing about the Station Eleven book tour with, um, I regret to say, verbatim quotes from oh, things no. people had said to me. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then when the pandemic hit, I thought, well, would it be interesting to filter that through a kind of sci-fi lens? And talk about being the author of a pandemic novel in a pandemic, but make it sci-fi. Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes sci-fi, you know, you were asking me earlier what that can give to you. It can give you a slight remove in a way that I think can be kind of helpful in thinking about an experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think sci-fi is the inverse of historical fiction in that both end up um, allowing you to reflect on the imaginative possibilities of what could be or what could have been in a way that's also refracting our particular contemporary moment. Right. right. It's always right. about both of those things at once. And, and here you've got this novel that's reaching in both directions in ways that I think is, is really, um, really fascinating. And so there's my favorite passage uh, in this novel. I'll, I'll do the thing where I get out my book and tell you it's on page 189 if you have this copy. <laughs> Um, is this section where um, Olive is giving this lecture about the post-apocalyptic and, and what it means to think about uh, our life in the post-apocalypse. And, and you give um, several uh, theories, I suppose, of, of why we're drawn to post-apocalyptic fiction. Um, and without presuming that your answer is Olive's answer, I'm really curious about um, the way that this novel can reflect on 2020 for us and, and what it is that continues to draw you back to the post-apocalyptic, what that continues to do for us. Yeah, that's, no, it's a good question. Um, the section you're referencing where she's talking about what draws us to post-apocalyptic fiction, um, I have to confess, I repurposed my Station Eleven lecture hmm. and gave it to Olive. Um, <laughs> because what happened was, you know, I'd been traveling around the U.S. for years from 2014 until, well, until March 2020, um, delivering this lecture on Station Eleven specifically, but on post-apocalyptic literature more broadly. And in 2020, I decided I didn't want to present lectures about post-apocalyptic fiction or pandemics anymore. Like, I felt a little bit done with that phase of my career. But it was kind of good material. <laughs> and I did want to think about it more. So, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time thinking and talking to people about why it is we're drawn, you know, why it is we're drawn to post-apocalyptic fiction. The answer that I came up with, I think, is not in the book, which is that I think it might have something to do with our technology that um, I think we feel a certain ambivalence towards the technology that surrounds us, the way that although we love our iPhones, they tether us to work, and the loss of privacy, you know, not just with social media, but the loss of the ability to be alone with your thoughts. You know, I think that 
we feel a certain ambivalence about that, and that um, when we seek out post-apocalyptic fiction, I think a part of it is a kind of secret, maybe half-acknowledged longing for a slightly less technological world. What we really want is post-technology, not post-apocalypse. So that's, yeah, that's my theory on that. You know, and it's so interesting. You've, you've called Station Eleven a post-technology novel more than it is a post-apocalyptic novel. Like, the, the, the pandemic is scientifically implausible and incidental, right? It um, kind of is, yeah, yeah. Which, is, which I know is weird, but yeah. Um, but this is a novel that is sci-fi in which, like, the technology enables everything that happens, but also kind of doesn't matter. Right. Right? You're, right. Not, you're not working us through, like, the, the physics of the dome on the yeah, moon. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, you know, I think is a clear choice you have to make as a sci-fi writer. You know, just how deep are you going to go into the technology? Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I really love some sci-fi that does go deep into it. Um, one of my favorite sci-fi novelists is Session Liu, who uh, he wrote The Three-Body Problem and other books. He goes so deep into the technology in a way that I think on paper wouldn't work for me. You know, if somebody told me, oh, there's this novel, and he goes on and on about um, futuristic technologies. Like, that would sound boring to me personally. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. He does it so well. I kind of took the opposite approach, which is I'm more interested in how people react to these weird new worlds that I'm creating. And, you know, so I I spent some time trying to think about what time travel might look like. Um, And then I realized it's just transport. You know, so if I'm not explaining how your car works in the 2020 sections, like, do I need to get into the time machine was sort of my feeling. And, yeah, I decided not to. But a person could go either way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I I love that decision um, because it it felt... um, it felt like it enabled the sort of reflection on, on the nature of what reality was, the nature of what time was, than, than rather necessarily the mechanics of it. Right. Um, which also feels like a very pandemic sort of metaphysical space to be It in. might be, it <laughs> might be, yeah. We've all had a very strange three years. Yeah. I was um, so nervous, as I was telling you, I was so nervous to read this novel. I, I teach Station Eleven all the time, and I haven't been able to go back to it. Um, and this feels, I think this feels like a safe space. I should confess mm-hmm. that I could not actually finish mm-hmm. the uh, adaptation either. I okay. made it to the end of the second episode, and it was beautiful, and I loved it, mm-hmm. kind of, but mostly I felt like, okay, I'm going to turn off those feelings now. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'll that's let my fair, husband watch right? yeah. this, and I'm going to yeah. go upstairs. Um, and so I was really nervous to return mm-hmm. to this book. I was really nervous to kind of go back to the February 2020 space. I was nervous to... Um, live in, in Olive's version of it, the pandemic that happens in, in 2203. Um, but in this, in this same section, I, I found this novel to actually be really healing in many okay. ways. Okay. Um, my students and I talk a lot in contemporary literature about what the responsibility of the novelist is, what we would think the pandemic novel could be, what we mm-hmm. want it to do for us, what it, what it needs to do. And I think that this book will be my answer um, to that question. Uh, because in this in the same passage in which Olive is talking about um, why we're drawn to post-apocalyptic literature, she has this beautiful um, this this beautiful reflection on on her her version of why, um, and, and she says our anxiety about about climate change, about technology, about global war, um, and here we might think about our 2020 anxieties about Trump, about the environment, about immigration, uh, about the war in Ukraine. Our anxiety is warranted, and it's not unreasonable to suggest that we might channel that anxiety into fiction. But the problem with that, anxi- with that theory is our anxiety is nothing new. When have we ever believed that the world wasn't ending? Um, and she continues, my point is there's always something. I think as a species, we have a desire to believe that we're living at the climax of the story. It's a kind of narcissism. We want to believe that we're uniquely important, that we're living at the end of history, that now, after all these millennia of false alarms, now is finally the worst that it's ever been, that finally we have reached the end of the world. What if it is always the end of the world? Um, and made me think about all of the little ends of the world that we experience mm-hmm. all the time, right? My daughter's end of the world when she can't pull her grilled cheese apart correctly. <laughs> That's an emergency. It really <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah. Or, or I think about all of the ends of the world that I just listed that I'm very anxious about. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, 
And by projecting this into the future, right, by thinking about this as a problem that Olive might deal with in 200 years, um, I, I think it really reframed that sort of narcissism, that sort of apocalyptic feeling that I have in ways that were really, um, really healing and, and transformative, I think. That's really nice to hear. That, um, yeah, that was, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my Station Eleven lecture. <laughs> um, so that, that part of it um, came out of a conversation I had with my mother a few years ago where she talked about how guilty and anxious she and her friends had felt bringing children into the world in the late 70s and early to mid 80s in Western Canada. And like, try to imagine a more tranquil time or place in all of human history. It's like, there's socialized medicine. I mean, like, everything's fine, you know? But in fairness, that was the height of the Cold War. And there was a not unreasonable fear of nuclear annihilation. So that just gave me that idea that, you know, this idea that the idea I encountered the most often in all of the time I spent on the road talking about post apocalyptic fiction was that, that we're drawn to it because we're anxious about the state of our world. But yeah, talking to my mother about that just made me realize when have we ever not been anxious about the state of our world? It always seems catastrophic. And that's not to suggest that our catastrophes aren't real. Mm -hmm. They absolutely are, and they're existential. But the grilled cheese is very real. Grilled cheese is real. Yeah. When you're two or three, three. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, grilled cheese is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, we. Uh, I think we do always have that idea that now is the worst it's ever been. Mm. Well, I think to reframe it that way too. Um, makes, if, if we're always living in apocalypse, right, then all literature is post-apocalyptic literature. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, which I think also reframes the idea of, of what it is that it means to survive. And I, I think that's where, to me, Station Eleven and the Glass Hotel, or um, and Sea of Tranquility, also the Glass Hotel, but this one in particular, we're really in conversation with each other, right? If everything is always the, the post-apocalypse, if that's the space we're right. always living in, well then survival is insufficient, right? right. That's right. the space for the artist. Because that's just where we are. Mm -hmm. we, we, yeah. Yeah, food, water, and shelter are not enough here or in the post-technological world of Station Eleven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask, Katie Waldman um, in The New Yorker referred to these three novels in particular, although all of your novels as well, Last Night in Montreal as well, um, referred to them as the Mandel Expanded Universe, um, which I loved. You've called it a multiverse now. Um, I hear that we're going to have an expanded cinematic universe as well. I mean, fingers crossed. Yeah, <laughs> Hollywood's really weird. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really interested in where we're going to be going next in this expanded universe. Are we going to the far colonies? Who are the characters that you don't want to let go of in this book that we might see recurring in the future? Um, I don't know yet with that book. It's still too soon. But I have been working on a new novel, which it's going to be a while till it's done because I'm only halfway through the first draft. But the protagonist of the new book is the villain from my second novel, The Singer's Gun, which came out a million years ago in 2010. So yeah, you know, that's a character that stayed with me. And I don't think The Singer's Gun really connects to any of the other books in any serious way. So that feels like a sort of offshoot of the, um, the cinematic universe. <laughs> <laughs> and now you were not involved with Station Eleven. I wasn't, no. Um, I was going to visit set, but then a pandemic happened. Oh, and sure. yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, COVID era film sets were intense. It was so locked down and there was no way for them to bring you know, to bring anyone on set, especially given that the set was in Canada. So it was a two-week quarantine any time anybody came in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I was not involved in the adaptation. But you have plans to be, assuming that the options for the Glass Hotel yeah. and Sea of Tranquility pan out? Yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah, where we are with those projects. Um, I had the opportunity to do a mini room, which is it's a TV term for a short writer's room, where um, you have about eight or 10 weeks. And at the end of that, we, uh, me and Patrick Somerville, who is the showrunner on the Station Eleven series, and other writers who were involved in the adaptation, we, we spent 10 weeks figuring out what a Glass Hotel limited series would look like, mm -hmm. uh, wrote two scripts, pitched it to HBO Max, and we're just kind of waiting to hear back. It's, it's kind of a strange moment of um, corporate consolidation and mergers in Hollywood. So there's a certain amount of chaos through the industry. And yeah, decisions are generally delayed, in my understanding. So I hope it works. It would be lovely if it did. Is that a different sort of, um, I don't know, I, that feels to me like a, a, just a different way of 
killing your darlings. Or maybe not killing mm -hmm. your darlings exactly, but a different sort of revision. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, it's really fun. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy <laughs> so it. So definitely not killing your darlings. Your darlings are alive like, and well and just doing something different I mean, now. I, I totally broke apart the book for the adaptation. So, like, I guess I was killing my darlings, but that sounds so negative. Like, I know that's the phrase, but, I, um, you know, it used to be that whenever I saw a movie or uh, watched a TV series that was based on a novel I loved, I would be kind of resentful that they changed so much. But, you know, what's become clear to me over the last several years of working a little bit in television is that these projects change because they have to. Because different mediums have totally different dramatic requirements, and what works on the page does not necessarily work on the screen, and vice versa, actually. Like, you know, those mediums just have different powers. So, for me, it was actually kind of fun to think, well, how can I take the story components of The Glass Hotel, break them apart, and rearrange them in a way that works for television? And, you know, I think what it came down to for me is that I do really like revision. Like, for me, when I'm writing a novel, the hardest part is the first draft, where I'm just kind of flailing around, hoping I can come up with something good. But then, when I have the first draft, which is like a block of raw story material, then it's only in the revisions that I find the book. So, you know, thinking about how a TV adaptation would work, it just felt like a different kind of revision. You know, just a much more radical experiment, and just breaking it apart and reassembling it. Mm -hmm. So on a very different and much lighter note, um, you love revision so much, and uh, one of my favorite things on the internet happened this year to you, uh, which involved the act of revision and a thwarted act of revision, um, which was that Emily uh, attempted to update her own Wikipedia page, her <laughs> own Wikipedia page. It is about her, and uh, was unable to do so. I was unable to do so. It turns out you're not actually an expert on your own life. I don't know if you realize that, but you need citations for Wikipedia. Um, yeah, so what happened? Uh, my Wikipedia page said I was still married, which was not the case. And like on the surface of it, it's like, who cares? Like Wikipedia is probably inaccurate. But I felt like that was a little bit awkward for my girlfriend. You know, it's like, like that's a red flag. You know, when your friends are like, did you know she's still married to somebody else? Like that's... That's kind of that's kind of a bad look. So, I um, yes. Yeah, so I contact. I realized that I couldn't just go in and edit it myself because they'd want some kind of source or something. Um, so I contacted this help email address at Wikipedia, where you're supposed to be able to correct inaccuracies. And um, I said, could you please just like delete the married line from the bio? And I cited the, um, the summary of divorce judgment for New York State. Um, <laughs> because, you know, again, like, you need a citation. So I was like, I thought that would cover it. It's like, yeah, um, Mandel versus Mandel. Like, it's really straightforward. Um, and the answer was no. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, they said, well, you know, we, uh, we don't use court records as a primary source. So I was like, OK. Um, so then I got in touch with a senior editor at Wikipedia. and. Whether the information he gave me was accurate is a little bit in question, but he said, you need to give an interview and tell the interviewer that you're divorced, and that needs to be in print, and only then will Wikipedia change your biography. <laughs> and like at this point, it's feeling a little Kafkaesque, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so um, this was the week before Christmas, and you know, I have amazing publicists, um, but interviews aren't something that just like half out of thin air, like you've got to publish a book or something. Um, <laughs> So I contacted my publicist at Knopf, and like if anyone could make an interview happen out of thin air, it would be Gabrielle. Um, she was like, it's the week before Christmas. Like, you know, we could maybe get something going in April or something. And that felt like a really long time to wait. Um, so I realized, well, I am followed by a lot of journalists on Twitter. I've been on Twitter for a really long time and, you know, talked to writers and, I, you know, I know some journalists. So I thought maybe I could just solve this problem myself. So I took to Twitter, um, <laughs> and I, I wrote a series of tweets. Um, the first one was something like, friends, did you know that if you have a Wikipedia page and you get a divorce, the only way to get your marital status updated is to give an interview where you say you're divorced? Sounds crazy, but Wikipedia runs on citations. And then I ended by saying, so all I want for Christmas is for a journalist to ask me if I'm divorced. <laughs> you know, um, for publication, online only is fine. Um, and, uh, and within about 
I want to say like a half hour, like really quickly, I got this email from Dan Coyes at Slate. Uh, subject header, I would totally interview you. Um, <laughs> he, it was this really like softball interview. Um, it was like five questions. One of them was, so are you still married? Um, <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> and then I sent that back to him and then I uh, went off Twitter. I went to play with my daughter for a couple hours. And by the time I came back, um, I had a BBC interview request. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the Slate article had been published as a totally normal interview with author Emily St. John Mandel. It's like, it was the most fun interview of my career. Um, and Wikipedia had been updated, so it, it worked out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this question, of course, is just to simply add to the citation account to make sure make sure that it's clear. Yeah, let the record show. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a totally different reason or a, a totally different way of thinking about our post-technology, post-apocalypse, <laughs> in which one can say, uh, this is what's happening in my life, and, yeah. and be the authority on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they can say, but where's your citation? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, we are going to turn to questions from the audience now. I'm sure there are lots of questions for Emily. I always feel like there should be hold music while the mic is traveling <laughs> through the... How's it going? Um, the most important question, I mean, for nerds like me, will it be a Station Eleven graphic novel? Oh. Um, I please, hope so. please, I, come I really, on. I really want it to happen, too. Um, so... The graphic novel would be a joint project with me and Patrick Somerville, uh, the writer on Station Eleven. And our plan is if the Glass Hotel is greenlit, that will require the graphic novel as part of the plot. Yeah, right? It would be awesome. Um, yeah, so if that happens, the plan is to release the graphic novel. But we have to finish writing it first. You're really using revision to your advantage here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I feel like you've probably answered this throughout your, the last five years or so, but uh, did Bernie Madoff have an effect on you and your family, or like, how, how did that connection just keep happening over and over? Yeah, sure. Um, so just context for this question, uh, the Madoff crime forms the basis for the crime in the Glass Hotel, which is why it comes up. Um, he didn't really affect me personally. Um, you know, my... my I did know somebody who uh, lost money to Madoff. Uh, he was lucky. It was not catastrophic. It wasn't his whole retirement savings. But I was just fascinated by that story. And the thing that fascinated me was partly the scale of the Madoff crime, which if you're unfamiliar is worth Googling. That was a $65 billion, with a B, U.S. Ponzi scheme. But more than that, at the time that story broke, I had a day job at a cancer research lab in New York. And... I, you know, I really liked the people I worked with. What I found myself thinking about was, you know, just the camaraderie that you have with a group of people going into the office every day, and like, even if they drive you crazy sometimes, there is hopefully a sense of shared mission, and you're doing a project together. About six or seven of Madoff staffers were arrested. So I just found myself thinking, what is that office like? <laughs> I mean, it's like, can you imagine that your job is to go into work on a Monday and perpetuate a massive crime? It's like, did you do the fake account statements? No, I need you to take, click what? <laughs> it's just, it's kind of psychotic. So, yeah, so I was fascinated by the idea of those office dynamics, and that was the starting point for the Glass Hotel. But I was wondering, when you talk about doing genre things like uh, post-pandemic or time travel, how do you, like, think about that in terms of, like, not treading on stuff that's already been written? Like, does it come, like, at the beginning of the story? Like you said, you wanted to write a time travel book. Was that the case with Station Eleven, too? And then you just thought, well, how can I make this unique? Or what's the process like for that? Um, I guess it's varied a bit for me. Where, yeah, with Station Eleven, while I was writing that book, I tried not to read other post-apocalyptic fiction. I'd already read quite a bit, uh, but mostly as a teenager. And I didn't want it to be too fresh in my mind. Um, I think sometimes you just have to have faith in yourself that you're writing something that hasn't been done exactly the same before. That being said, I do sometimes have a feeling like there might not be an infinite number of stories, and maybe what you're trying to do as a writer is, you know, something a little bit more than remixing, but you can have things in your work that also appear in other works. like a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction has a prophet figure in it. 
And, you know, that's not because I'm paying homage to other works. It's because I think that's the kind of person who would inevitably rise in a power vacuum. Um, so, you know, sometimes those things recur for a reason like that. Yeah, you know, I try not to make it similar to anybody else's. I think sometimes there are elements in common, but my hope is always just that the whole of the project will be different from another person's project, even if there are through lines, you know, in the genre space. Yeah, I read that um, a lot of writers, when they'll start their books, they have no idea where it's going to go. I don't know if that's part of your workflow or not, but I am curious to know at one point, did you know Gasperi was not just the traveler, but the reason? I really appreciate the way you framed that without spoilers. That was not easy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was excellent phrasing. Um, I, I, I am absolutely in that camp. I don't know how my books are going to end when I start writing them. Sea of Tranquility was a little bit unusual in that at least I knew what the structure was going to be. Because I think this will be obvious to anybody who's read both books, but I owe a huge debt to David Mitchell's novel Cloud Alice, which uses that same kind of symmetrical structure. Um, I did not know Gaspari was going to be a reason until, like, I was about to send the book to my agent. It was the very, very end, <laughs> which, wow. I, thank you. Um, I appreciate that reaction. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'd finished the book, and I remember lying there in bed thinking, I just feel like something's missing. Like, can I, is there some, something I could do? Like, I wanted to perform some kind of maneuver that would just tie it up. And then it was just this moment of realization, oh, I could do this and that and this, and Gaspari could be that. And I think without that, it wouldn't have worked. So that was, yeah, it was just a very lucky add-on at the end. Well, Gaspari has a moment of realization, not unlike the one I imagine that you had in that process, right? That's Where a good point. Yeah, it's not a He's massive a, revelation to him. Right. It's simply a. It's like, oh wait, coming to knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So my question is actually kind of similar to the last one, but I know you've said that your writing process is largely based on finding the novel through revisions, but I was wondering if any of your novels have started with like the idea. Mm -hmm kind of in totality, and then you've just ran with it from there? Um, no. <laughs> they, they, they haven't, it's a short answer. You know, I've definitely started, yeah, I, I think the most complete ideas I started with were Station Eleven and The Glass Hotel. Probably mostly The Glass Hotel, of all of them. Where Station Eleven, the only idea that I had going in was you know, I knew I wanted to write about, about artists, about devoting your life to your art. So I knew I was going to have the traveling company of actors. I didn't know it was going to be post-apocalyptic when I started writing it. I was going to set it in the, prem in the present day. But I did always have that character dying on page two. You know, the, uh, the actor dying of a heart attack in the fourth act of Lear. I would say The Glass Hotel was the most complete in terms of the premise being executed in the final book, where... Um, you know, every character in the Glass Hotel is completely fictional, which I like to get out of the way so I don't get sued by Madoff investors. Um, this is my like, legal language of the evening. Um, yeah, I, every character is fictional, but the crime is based on Madoff's Ponzi scheme. So that kind of suggests an arc that, you know, I knew that there would be this massive white collar crime and that a major character would be arrested and that he'd die in prison. And that was always, that, that was always part of it. But Usually there is just a premise, and I don't know how it's going to end. I've never had a book where I had the completed idea and then sat down and wrote it. Um, so I really appreciate what you were saying about how fiction has changed a little bit and that um, books can be multi-genre, and that's a little bit more acceptable. I was wondering what advice you might have for somebody who's starting out at the point where, you know, writing with a day job who's looking to be kind of in your position at some point um, <laughs> with kind of the ch current changing landscape of genre fiction, even from how it was five years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a day job that I held on to until a year after Station Eleven came out. Um, I had this idea that when I quit my day job, I would have infinite time, but I had a kid right after I quit my day jobs like that. Uh, you know, that, that feels like there's always something. You know, so what I personally found helpful in that position was to find a day job that 
didn't make me want to die. Like, not to be too gothic about it, but work can be terrible. Um, so what worked for me personally was finding a job that wasn't too stressful. And for me, we're all wired differently. Not having this, that stress in my life made it more possible to write. Um, it Just like practically speaking, I found that writing with a day job required a certain level of social ruthlessness where, you know, if I had plans with two friends in a given week, I probably wasn't making plans with a third just because I needed the time to write. I didn't watch as much TV as I wanted to, which is actually kind of bad for my TV writing part of my life. It's like it's actually a problem, but, um, but it did allow me to get more work done. If you can train yourself to write anywhere under any circumstances, that really helps. Like, if you can write for 45 minutes in Starbucks on your lunch break, that's, you know, that adds up. Um, in terms of genre, my feeling is that writing a book is hard. And <laughs> like, you know, you've got to be interested in it. And if the thing that interests you is like the vampire romance with a time traveling dragon, like whatever it is, you know, I think, um, I think it's better to go with that and try to write the best thing you possibly can and not try to predict the market because the market changes constantly. And it's a different market now than it will be in three years when you finish your book. So yeah, I hope that helps. That's, yeah, sure. I had a quick question. I'm working my way through. I have two, book, two of your books left. Um, what, why do you find yourself drawn to nonlinear narrative? Um, I've always just found them really interesting. You know, uh, not just as a writer, but also as a reader. One of my favorite novels ever written was A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan, which if you guys like nonlinear narratives, I can't recommend highly enough. It's, it's so nonlinear that it was marketed as a short story collection in some markets. And like, honestly, you can make either argument. Um, I find those narratives just really interesting to read and they're really fun to write. There is a sense of putting a puzzle together, figuring out where all the pieces fit. They're kind of good for character development. It's interesting to see a character at a particular point in their lives and then maybe get them from a completely different perspective, you know, in a completely different timeline in the next chapter, and then go back. Like, that can be interesting. They can be good for contrasting worlds or timelines where it seemed to me that in Station Eleven, I could, that book is probably, I want to say it's about a 60-40 split. It's about 40% present day, 60% post-apocalyptic. I could have a character in the post-apocalyptic section say, wasn't it amazing when there were airplanes? Or I could just drop an airplane into the next chapter because I'm going back in time. So yeah, there are a lot of reasons why I find it really appealing. I don't know that I know how to write a linear novel, if we're being absolutely honest in this, in this intimate safe space here. Um, you know, I, I, I've never done it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just drawn to that form. So I know you have, like, your books, they kind of defy genre. Do you have an ideal reader in mind? Mm -hmm. And if you do, would you be able to describe this ideal reader? And if not, that is okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. I, I think my ideal reader is open to, I guess, open to genre. I think we have a tendency as a species toward kind of rigid classification. You know, I'm this or that. I read this kind of book, but not that kind of book. And yeah, so I guess my ideal reader is someone who's maybe willing to suspend that for a moment to say, well, you know what? Time travel is not actually my usual thing, but maybe I'll give it a chance. That's my ideal. Um, just going back to the nonlinear storytelling that you do, um, from a work perspective, I'm always curious, with this, with C.H. Rowley, there's four different timelines? Yeah, that's right. Do you write one timeline at a time, or is it just mm -hmm. you sit down during the day and say, today I'm going to write 1912, and then tomorrow you sit down and you're like, no, I'm going to write 2022, or whatever? Um, I just kind of jump around all over the place, honestly, where I would say Sea of Tranquility was a little bit more straightforward in that way, because I did have that structure going in. Usually, I just kind of jump all over the place, which is really good for kind of writer's block moments, by the way. You know, something I really recommend if you're working on something is if you don't know what comes next, just go write a totally different part of the narrative and come back to that problem later. And you might be able to solve it. You know, you'll have a different view of what's going to happen. So, you know, I remember with Station Eleven, 
reach kind of hitting a wall pretty early on in the first draft where I was just thinking, okay, I've written three chapters from this guy Jeevan's perspective. What was I doing with this character again? Like, I just didn't really know what happened next. But it was fine, because I could set that aside and then go write a Miranda chapter and then come back to Jeevan later, kind of with fresh eyes. So, yeah, I kind of prefer to jump all over the place. Also, I don't write from an outline. So sometimes I'll get pretty far along and then realize oh, I could create a cool effect by changing the plot way back here and like setting something up in this future segment. Yeah, there's, uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And you chose Philadelphia for Gaspari's big reveal to Olive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like Philadelphia. That's yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess I'm really interested in all of your books. There seems to be a palpable sensation, or it leaves me with a feeling of satisfying, nostalgic, um, very poignant grief and loss. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, you know, when you're writing February 2020 or when you're writing Station 11, how do you understand grief and loss? And how are you able to create that kind of sensation, at least for me, but I'm sure maybe others too? So what is your relationship to grief and loss? And then how do you put that in there? I mean, we've all lost something or someone. So I feel like I feel like that's a sensation that we can all kind of access. And it just happens that I'm writing fiction. So you know, I definitely draw on that to uh, to make it feel real. Hey, I just uh, got lucky and stumbled onto your work uh, about six, seven weeks ago. So very excited to just oh, jump into for everything. Reading. Yeah, I came in from Pittsburgh. I couldn't, I couldn't make it to Hong Kong. So like, <laughs> I get to tell you. But um, so very limited uh, knowledge from which to ask a question and awesome questions so far. But um, Kirsten is such an incredible uh, character. She's somebody who maybe her and her brother that first year and references to it with you know memory. But then it's like it's so bad that it's repressed. Is that something like graphic novel worthy, or at least someone she could be in your uh, Hall of Heroes for future, future work and attention? Yeah, maybe. I could definitely see writing about her again. I, I liked her, too, as a character. Yeah, those, um, those references to repressed memory, like, that goes to a general philosophy I have about writing violence and horror, where you know, it, it's kind of a similar quandary as the sci-fi question I was talking about, where like, do you get deep into how the technology works or take the opposite approach? With violence and horror, you can get deep into the details of that. And sometimes that really works. Um, one of my favorite novels of the last decade or so is Preparation for the Next Life by Atticus Lish. That is an intensely, brutally violent work, and it never feels gratuitous. Like It works in the context. It seems to me that sometimes it's enough to just hint at something, and that your imagination as a reader can fill in the gaps probably with material that's at least as horrifying as anything I can write. So yeah, in Station Eleven, that was that lost year on the road. And it was also whatever happened on board that jet and the Severn City Airport, mm -hmm. where I felt like I didn't need to describe those last minutes on board. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I would absolutely return to Kirsten. I, I liked her too. Hi. Um, earlier, you mentioned about the remittance idea, and you wanted to expand on that, so I was just hoping you could elaborate on it for us. Oh, sure. Yeah, so very briefly. <laughs> um, um, there was, so this, this relates back to a great-grandfather of mine, uh, Newell St. Andrew St. John. Like, you thought my name was long. Um, <laughs> so, he, yeah, my great-grandfather, he left London in about 1908 and came to Canada as a remittance man. And all that was, the law in England at that time was that if a family had any wealth, the entire estate had to go to the eldest son, which raised the question of what you do with your extra sons. And uh, a solution back then was to send them overseas to Canada or Australia or the United States to kind of try to make a go of it. They were the most privileged class of immigrants. Um, you know, they were receiving essentially a trust fund from back home. At the same time, there was something a little poignant about them to me in that they were utterly unprepared for literally anything. Um, you know, like these were, these were boys, really. My great-grandfather was 18, recipients of these beautiful classical educations. They would have studied Greek, Latin, rhetoric, and history. Zero business skills. Like, you know, just absolutely nothing that would work in the real world in any way. And... You know, some of them failed pretty spectacularly to make a go of it. My, my great-grandfather certainly did. So, 
Yeah, it was just kind of a weird, interesting little corner of the Canadian immigration experience that I wanted to write about. So last question just from me. This runs the risk of being a fun question. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Uh, but I just wondered, uh, you mentioned the Severn City Airport, um, and one of the, the images that I've loved most, that I loved most from Station Eleven was the Museum of Civilization. Uh, and so I just wondered what, what your contribution would be to a Museum of Civilization. Um, I think it would be a globe. And it's like, what I found myself thinking about when I wrote Station Eleven was how small the world would become if telecommunication systems and travel were really no longer a thing. You know, you wouldn't know what was happening in New York City, let alone Brazil or China or London. Um, and I think it would be easy to forget how big the world is. So, yeah, I think that's the one object I would really want to see. I love that. Well, Emily, thank you so much. This My has pleasure. been such a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.